Welcome to the Influential Women of Northeast Indiana live chat today, brought to you by KPC Media and sponsored by Tilde Multimedia Firm. My name is Lou Phelps, CEO of KPC, and I'll be serving as your moderator. For the next two hours, you'll have the opportunity to hear from 15 interesting and diverse women who've made an impact in their career field, as well as in their communities many of whom have overcome difficult odds to do so. We believe their stories will inspire you and perhaps give you some ideas of how you might climb the business ladder or start a business or go back to school for additional prof professional education, all while juggling a family, a home, and your own life. And we think you'll also find that many of you may want to do business with their companies or get involved with their charitable activities. We had hoped to have a great luncheon this year event and get all get together, but due to COVID-19 concerns, we've taken this approach again this year, a live Zoom event. Next October, we hope we can all be together. We're holding this event in October because October is Women in Business Month, celebrated nationally and celebrated here at KPC Media Group. Last week, we published a special editorial section with all of their stories. You can read it in its entirety at FW Business. We've divided our honorees into two groups. In the first group, you'll have a chance to hear from Sherry Berghoff from One Purpose Marketing, Kristen Marcaselli from Star Financial Bank, Amanda Shepard from Fort Wayne Museum of Art, Councilwoman Sharon Tucker, from the city of, of Fort Wayne, Rebecca Essage with Purdue University Fort Wayne, and Susan Ralston with Jacob Insurance. They'll each tell you a little about their careers and how they got started. And then we'll talk about some of the challenges that women face when they work outside the home, sometimes in fields which have traditionally been more male dominated, from engineering to politics to insurance. As you listen to them, Text us any questions you'd like to ask them and we'll pose them to our panel as time allows. Use the Q&A area on your screen. At the end of the hour, we'll take a quick break and then you'll hear from six more honorees in our second hour. And that is Amanda Hines, Shannon Bradley, Virginia Richardson, Juanita Ray, Madeline Sade Bartle, and T. Cook. Feel free to jump in and out of the two hour session if you need to. Through your registration for the event, we will be sending you the contact information of all 15 honorees who've agreed to allow you to follow up with them with any mentoring questions you might have. So let's begin. I'd like to introduce Sherry Berghoff. Sherry, tell us a little bit about your career, how you got started. Oh my gosh. Uh, so it's been a winding road, right? There's no straight path, um, at least not in my journey in my career. So um, about uh, early 2000s, let's start there, uh, had an opportunity just to reinvent myself, went through a divorce and really needed to figure out uh, what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, started thinking about uh, opportunities and I found myself in a position in healthcare and uh, serving in a long-term care uh, industry and just fell in love with it. And I've been in love with the senior living industry ever since. So uh, really worked my way up through um, senior living, started at the ground level, went on to get my administrator's license, move into regional roles and then VP roles. Um, so just all along though, it's a male dominated industry, uh, at least at the top in terms of ownership and uh, really felt like I had an opportunity or had a vision for what I wanted long-term care to look like. And at, all along I've been working towards that vision and uh, this uh, jumping off into my own uh, businesses this year, it was just the next step in that. So I know I was introduced as One Purpose Marketing, but One Purpose is an umbrella for four different organizations. So we have One Purpose Marketing, One Purpose Senior Healthcare, One Purpose Senior Services, 
And then what the one industry that I'm most, or the one organization I'm most proud of, and that's a One Purpose Senior Adventures, which is our non-for-profit. Thank you, Sherry, very much. Um, next up, Kristen Marcuselli from Star Financial Bank. Thank you, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Kristen Marcuselli, Chief Operating Officer for Star Bank. Uh, I started my career actually in college football operations at Notre Dame, so definitely a, ma a male-dominated environment. Oh, yes. Learned many wonderful lessons. Um, I've served at Star for just over 13 and a half years, and we are a privately held, family-owned community bank with about $2.8 billion in assets. Um, I'm a very proud third generation family member involved in the, the organization, my father's second generation, and he's our current chairman and CEO, but my grandfather was the T in STAR, so it's an acronym for the first names of the four founders, uh, but we have about 500 employees serving Northeast and Central Indiana at approximately 40 locations. Um, I'm, I'm currently located in Waynedale with about 160 of those 500 and have the pleasure of working alongside amazing leaders who help drive STARS technology, our, our bank operations, uh, security, fraud investigation, project management, and construction. So wow. many, many hats, but I love every bit of it. Well, we look forward to hearing more in our, in our later parts of the program. Next up is Amanda Shepard from Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Amanda. Thank you, Lou. Uh, yes, I've been at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art uh, since I graduated from college. I studied art at the University of Notre Dame, and I was an intern between my junior and senior years and really loved that experience and was uh, offered a job upon graduation. And that's what I've been doing since then. I've had roles in education, uh, and now I've been in administration for the past 11 years or so. So I manage a team of 12 which manages the facility, marketing, administration, strategic planning, budgeting, agency, fundraising, just about everything. Yes. Uh, a lot of fun. And I'd say what I do is I help, I help other people make good decisions. It's what I'm doing all day long. <laughs> um, this is our 100th year as wow. an institution in Fort Wayne. Uh, we started in the West Central neighborhood in 1921 with roots going back all the way to 1888 with art classes in that neighborhood. We built our professional facility here in downtown in 1984. And in 2010, we added 10,000 square feet to the building. And that's when I really got my start in administration and long-term planning. So I'd say that one of the hallmarks of my career, and, and at least this cohort of staff that I've been working with for the last 14 years, is professionalizing the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. We're relatively young in terms of American museums, so we're always trying to bring ourselves up to national professional standards. Great, interesting, fascinating. Uh, your story was fascinating, too, in the special section. We look forward to hearing more. Uh, next up, Councilwoman Sharon Tucker, the city of Fort Wayne. City Council. Sharon. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. I'm low-key fangirl and to be on here with everybody. It's like, how did I rank? But I appreciate the opportunity um, to be here with you. I actually, in the political realm, got my career started in um, 2012. And it just all came from a process of walking through um, many, many steps and God opening doors. And one gentleman asking me if I would be interested in running. And I'm going, you know, it's either now or never. And that's what opened the door for me. And um, Fort Wayne politics at that time was all men, um, all Caucasian men. And it was a world that breaking my foot into the door was kind of difficult without the support of that, um, that young man. And since I've been involved in politics, I have sworn to myself, I will not make it that hard for other women to get involved. <laughs> So I've tried to reach back in every opportunity that I can um, to be able to help other ladies get involved. But politics is only a portion of who I am. I'm also a, a mom, a wife, a sister, and I'm involved with many, many things. But the one thing that I'm greatly, greatly um, most proud of right now is the opportunity that I have with Vincent Village, which we are one of the oldest organizations that help keep families together. So I get to see little bitty people every single day to be able to help make their lives a little bit better. Absolutely. And I just feel like I get to do God's work 
in both of my realms. So um, that's a little bit about me. But before I go, I have to say happy birthday to my nephew, Jalen. Today is his birthday. <laughs> I know he's probably not watching, but I think his mom or his aunties might be. Well, they'll watch the video afterwards because it's live for a long time. And we've learned over the years now as KPC keeps getting better and better and more professional at these webinars and these live events, how many people do hook up and share it and watch it over a long period of time, including on our YouTube channel. Sharon, we look forward to hearing more from you and um, in that white male, uh, male dominated political world and how you got going. Um, next up is Rebecca Essage from Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Rebecca, tell us a little bit about your career, what you're doing yes. now. Thank you so much. Um, as Liz said, I'm Becca Essig from Purdue Fort Wayne. I'm an assistant professor of engineering and I also am the first year engineering program coordinator. So I teach all of the first 100 level classes um, at Purdue Fort Wayne for our engineers. Uh, my background, I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in civil engineering from Purdue University. So I just kind of moved Purdue to Purdue. <laughs> and um, one of my biggest things that I'm passionate about is trying to increase the number of women going into engineering and increasing the diversity in general, because we definitely need it. So I am one of the founders of the Future Girls of STEM Engineering Summer Camp. It's a summer camp that introduces second through fifth grade girls to different types of engineering and engineering mentors. So we bring in practicing women engineers that they can meet and get to work with throughout the week. Um, and then in addition to that, for the last year, I've been working to start a women in engineering sorority chapter here at Purdue Fort Wayne so that they can um, you know, feel a little less alone in their classes. <laughs> And outside of that, I'm also on the board of directors of the uh, St. Joseph River Watershed Initiative because I have a background in environmental uh, fluid mechanics. So thank you all for having me today. Fascinating, fascinating. And next is, and uh, last in our first group is Susan Ralston with Jacob Insurance. Good Susan. morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. I am a longtime insurance agent. I uh, started with the agency back in 1977 when I was hired in high school. Wow. And the ranks from there, um, mentors were the four male owners of the agency. Three of the four were family members, the fourth being a non-family member. But they basically groomed me for the position I hold today, which is managing member of the agency. Uh, so I consider my career from the bottom to the top. I uh, wouldn't change it for the world. It has been a whirlwind and a great ride. I love what I do, passionate about what I do continually. I look to mentor anyone that I can in the field of insurance, which nobody ever thinks about going into, but it has been a fantastic career and I wouldn't change it. Oh, it's so. great. We look forward to hearing more. And it was, it was interesting read too, in your, your story about you. It was really interesting. Well, great. Thank you all. Now we're going to go back and start off with Sherry and our first question. So our core purpose of this event, when we envisioned it, uh, was to inspire women to progress in their career, to hear how other women have started or bought a business or got promoted in their job, and to expand our audience's network of potential members. I mean, sorry, mentors, but we're women and that brings some different dynamics in the career fields that we're in. We'd like you to each take a minute or so and talk with our audience about how you have juggled work and your professional life as you've been building your career um, or how you've maybe financed your higher education while you were working, if you did so, et cetera. But you know, we all understand that it's a little, it's, maybe it shouldn't be, but it's a little different for women to juggle some of all of this. So let's start with, um, Sherry from One Purpose Marketing, you know, um, how have you juggled things as you've been moving up in your career, you know, in life? And you went through a divorce you shared with us. Um, so I think it, I think you just make it happen, um, at least for me. So I've never really separated my career from my life. My, whatever I was doing at that time, I just incorporated it as part of my life. And so I never tried to keep like, 
what people call a work-life balance. It just was part of who I was. And so my kids and my family understood that. So they were involved in what I was doing just as much as what uh, I was involved. So it became uh, more of a family thing rather than just this is what mom is doing at the current time. So I've kind of always lived my life that way, um, making sure that I gave time to each area of my life, to my children, to my friends, to my parents. And um, then of course, to what I'm passionate about at that time, whatever that work was at that time. So I think it really is about just getting rid of that. I think we grew up and through school, they taught us work-life balance, work-life balance. And, and, guilt. and I, I mean, it's a guilt, different, right? You know, yeah, like I, you don't, you know, the, you don't burden with some of the guilt that some of us maybe have. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's exactly it. It does burden people with guilt when you, um, when you set yourself up with that mindset. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think I've been fortunate over the years. I think the right people have been put in my path all along my life. I look back at the individuals that were in my life at certain periods and absolutely they were there for the reason of the growth that I was intended to, to experience. And so um, I think, I think that's how I have been able to climb through so many uh, obstacles uh, that I have overcome in my life is just because of that. Um, perception of this is just part of who I am. And um, I will not feel guilty because I'm passionate about my work or because I'm passionate about my family or because I'm passionate about spending time with my friends. I won't feel guilty for those things. And I really contribute that to the mentors that have been in my life all along. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's what this is all about. You know, Chris, uh, Kristen um, Marcuselli's Nest from Star Financial, and you're in a unique situation in a family owned business, a woman. And, you know, I bet you've maybe found yourself at times trying to convince people, you know, I, I'm running, doing the job because I'm capable, not because daddy gave it to me. But how have you managed work and business and, and you know, come on. And, and you were at Notre Dame football. Good Lord. So, you know, talk to us a little bit how you've managed to juggle all this. Well, I hope it's OK, but I, I think you could uh, you'll have to chalk me up as a, a work in progress in this area because I will be the first to admit that it's an area that I continue to work on because, you know, it's just flat out challenging to balance your own self-care with time with family and friends, your career, and, and so many more opportunities to volunteer and, and get involved outside of those things. So you know, I think in, in Northeast Indiana, we have so many unique opportunities to get engaged with a multitude of, of amazing organizations, right? And one of the best lessons I've learned is that it, it has to start with knowing yourself um, and knowing where you want to go, right? What really uh, motivates you and inspires you? Where, where is your time the most valuable where, where given? Um, so knowing what you're passionate about, knowing what really fills your tank, so to speak, because if you're intentional about that and you're, you're really intentional about it, I think you'll spend your time and offer your very best yes to places. And otherwise, I think, I think it's so easy to find yourself overloaded, overwhelmed, and out of balance. So I, I think it's through intentionality. Interesting. Well, very good. And we're all, I think we're all works in progress, you know, whether it's young kids or aging parents, right? Or, you know, a sister in the crisis, you know, we're all juggling all the time. Amanda, how have you juggled all of this? Well, I, I think I have some unique attributes that have been touched upon by others already. Um, I am married to the CEO of the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. So I have a similar uh, situation as, as Kristen. And uh, I won't lie, my husband gave me the opportunity to do what I'm doing now. And I'm very grateful to him for that. So in some ways, the balance is great because, you know, everything is blended and we're always handing off the other to the other person, but it's not easy. It's never, it never has been easy and never will be easy. Um, just because you can't separate it as much as sometimes I, I wish we could, you yes. know, every vacation is determined by what we've got going on at the museum and what the kids have going on. And, um, I had a child when I was 24, so I, I just started in uh, my field, and so working for me was 
you know, I wanted to work, but I absolutely had to so that I could have a home for my son. So uh, it, it, that doesn't mean the guilt hasn't been there. Um, my family is the most important thing to me. And as a, a person of faith, I've just had to look at everything as part of my mission while I'm here on earth. And if that mission at one point is, hey, you got to give this up, you know, to serve your family, that's just something that every day I have to come to terms with that what I have today might not be here tomorrow. Interesting, very thoughtful. Miss Tucker, how have you juggled your family and all this in politics and everybody knows you and uh, you can't go to the grocery store without someone talk, stopping to talk to you, you know? Somebody's so, trash has to be picked up. <laughs> everybody's trash has to be picked up. The number one reason they call you, amen. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you right now without a shadow of a doubt that I am who I am only but for one group of people and that's my family. If it were not for my mom and for my sisters, I would not be here. Um, much like Sherry, I went through a divorce back in 2007, and that's when I decided to reinvent myself. Um, went back to school, Indiana Tech. Shout out to you, Warriors. Um, <laughs> And my, my mom, my sisters, they were there. They were there to help me with my, my little person that was at home who was looking at me. Um, if it hadn't been for them, I don't know that I would be able to do a lot of the things that they allowed me to do. Um, my mom always raised us to be um, not in competition with anybody, but competition with ourselves. And I have some dynamic sisters who are just mind blowing. And so it, we just come from a work ethic. So the balance really isn't an issue. The thing that we have to be able to do and we've given ourselves permission to do. And I think I've, I'm okay with saying no. <laughs> I'm okay <laughs> with saying, nope, can't do that. Um, and that's okay. And we are a, we are really, really tight family that when we decide um, to have fun we have fun. I mean, life shuts <laughs> down, we close out, cell phones are gone, work is canceled. But when we're at work, we work. And I think it's only because being able to see the strive that my sisters put in, the strive that my mom puts in, she was a business owner as well, um, that helps us make it through. And when I see other women who I have to go out and say, you know, sis, take a minute for yourself. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I do it. I do it. Yeah. I Councilwoman Chambers can tell you, I say to her all the time, sis, you can't be at everything. Relax. Yeah. Take a moment, yes. take a moment. And it's that okay because, building. yeah, yeah. And the world will keep going. Yeah, and we'll celebrate be invited what you are getting done. <laughs> yeah, celebrate what you are getting done and what you are volunteering at and not what you're not getting done. Yes. Absolutely, yes. very wise. And, and find that, find that, find that group around that you can surround. It may not be family, um, but it may be a friend or it may be a confidant or a neighbor. Find that person that you can go to and say, I'm gonna pull my hair out if I get one more <laughs> call or one more trash can, it doesn't get picked up, but then go back the next day and do what you need to do. I hear you. For me, it's one more newspaper that didn't get delivered this morning. As mm -hmm. if, you know, oh yeah. Uh, Rebecca, at Rebecca Essich from Purdue University, Fort Wayne. How have you been juggling all this? And, you know, male dominated field engineering, you know, talk about how have you been juggling all this? Sometimes better than others. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I related so much to what's been said already. Um, I think, you know, the really big thing is some of us um, do much better and will thrive under separating work from home life and really having that established boundaries. And then there's others that are going to, you know, that their work does bring them joy and fills up their bucket versus taking it out. So I think it's just really important for us all to like give ourselves permission to be honest about what activities we want to allow to bleed over versus the ones that need to have more clear boundaries. You know, um, the thing I am working on constantly, I am a work in progress on this also, is learning to say no and that it's okay to have boundaries. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> I'm getting better, but it's a slow road. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, there's some activities that I definitely you know, I enjoy doing on the weekends that are work related. For instance, you know, a couple weekends I was at volunteering for a Girl Scout event and it was my Saturday, but that's okay because I loved doing it and it made me happy at the end. But, you know, at the end of the night, when I see five work emails, 
well, that's probably not going to make me super happy <laughs> to address right away. So I usually look and give myself permission that if it's not an emergency, it's okay to answer the next morning. I don't need to respond right away. Um, and I think that is something that I wish I had learned a little sooner, but I also recognize, and I think that people will probably relate to that depending on what um, industry you're in or depending on what stage of life you're in, you may not feel like you can give yourself boundaries and, and that's okay. Just know that you wanna work towards it, but uh, cut yourself some slack with it. <laughs> so yeah, find those things. If your work makes you happy and makes you feel good to do in other parts, then don't feel like you have to have a strict work-life balance. But if you need that mental break, give yourself permission to take it. Yeah. Um, all wise. And I'm still working at it at my age. <laughs> the news business is not nine to five, you know, 24, seven, 365. So it's like, you know, yeah, it's, the guy's dead. You know, he's still going to be dead tomorrow. You know, am I going to write it at two in the morning or am I going to deal with it at seven? You know, it's, it's a tough business. Um, Susan Ralston, Jacob Insurance. Share with us, you know, how have you managed family and life and all these things in a very big business and difficult industry and people have got problems and crises and insurance? How have you managed to juggle all this? Well, as mentioned before, I have given myself finally permission to uh, breathe and to be. Uh, it's, it's hard to do when you do have a job that is 24-7, 365 like yours. Uh, with the fact that I do need to separate at some point what is important and what can wait. I have learned to do that, which is a good thing. It's, again, taken me 44 years to really begin to be able to do that. And I'll be honest, I still answer emails. I'm on vacation right now in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Oh. I've been on and off throughout this whole week, but that's okay. You have your downtime. My downtime is handling work. I took the time to have uh, fun and, you know, do our, our uh, vacation, but yet still work is there. But, and my husband is very understanding with that. He's been with me for almost 40 years. I'm thankful for that. We have one son that I was able to raise. Uh, we were able to raise together with working opposite shifts. It was a trial. We would wave at each other. I would be going to work. My husband would be coming home. Um, mm -hmm. It was just, you know, a lot of trials looking back, but I wouldn't, again, would not trade it for anything. Uh, the work I do is very rewarding to me. It's a constant uh, learning. That is the beauty of it. And the fact that I love what I do, I'm passionate about what I do. And the fact that I am still able and willing to learn, I think is what keeps me rolling and keeps me going. Very good. Very good. Well, that is just great. Thank you all. Okay. Now we're going to go to our second question. We're going to go back to Sherry. So our second question is most women, women working outside of the home in a career have run into roadblocks. It might've been a terrible boss or a person who didn't view you as capable of moving up the ladder, or it might've been you that you didn't view yourself as able to do more or your family, spouse, your kids, um, who were not always supportive. Would you share with us a challenge that you've run into and how you got past it? Was there a mentor who really lift you up or did you just decide you guys are all wrong and I'm gonna do this? Okay, so let us start with Sherry. Sherry again with One Purpose Marketing. Sherry, start us off. Talk to us about something you ran into that was tough to get over and how you did it. So I, again, I'll go back to, I really think that there've been people in my life all along that have gotten me through those periods. Uh, and the biggest one I, I probably want to think about is uh, I was in high school and uh, it was my senior year and I was graduating midterm and um, I missed a, I missed a test. And in this particular class, in this particular English honors English class, the professor, if you missed a test, you automatically failed the class. You didn't have an opportunity to, to make that up. Um, and I just can remember how devastated I was because I was a really good student and the thought that I was going to have an F on my report card just wasn't sitting very well with me. And I had another uh, teacher that Mr. Kirkton, uh, who was really my mentor all through high school, 
said to me, Sherry, that one class is not going to keep you from accomplishing what you want to accomplish in life. And without that, I'm not sure that I would have uh, believed that. I would have thought that I was, I think I would have come out of high school feeling like a failure because I was so dependent on that, that confirmation of who I was through my grades. Um, but all along my career, I can think of obstacles that I came up against and um, it was someone or something or uh, that happened that mentored me through that and, and helped me overcome it. And then most recently, of course, then, you know, I'm, I'm working in a male dominated industry, at least at the upper level in terms of ownership in healthcare. And um, I really just went to the owner and said, I think I'm in the wrong seat on the bus and I need, I need to really do something of my own to, to accomplish the vision I have of how to change healthcare. And um, that really stemmed out of, I was coaching a team of sales marketing individuals and I was coaching them, live your passion, live your vision, do what's right for you. And if, if being a sales and marketing director for me is not what you're passionate about, let me help you uh, get, get into the role that you feel like is most beneficial to you. And as I was telling that to them, I felt almost hypocritical because here I am not doing what I was really passionate about. And that was ah. creating my own organization. So like, it was, yeah. yeah, it was through coaching them. And then um, I had a great team uh, that I was working with at the time. And for bosses day, they gave me a book that was called uh, everything is figure outable. Uh, and I fell in love with the book and, uh, just said, you know what, I can't do this to my team. I'm coaching you to live your passion, live your dream, and I'm not doing it. So in order to be able to be a good mentor to you, I have to do this. And so I made up my mind and in January, I formed all four of my organizations and I've been building them since. That's amazing. Well, and all the blessings and con congratulations in the future. We keep what we look excited to follow what all happens with them. Okay, next is um, Kristen. Kristen, you have to run into a few challenges, you know, or difficult situations, you know, that's right. Or you had to just look somebody in the face and yet, yes, you know, I am in charge of this. So, um, you know, and you're young and blonde. Um, I used to say, um, I'm actually a southerner and I don't talk with a southern accent because. In the South, when you're a woman, blonde, and Southern, you are triple stupid uh, to anyone outside the South. And so, you know, and I always looked like I was 12. Uh, so you've got to have had some challenges that should inspire some young people on this on this video today, on this, on this live chat. Tell us about your challenges you've run into. I won't throw my boss under the bus, but I, <laughs> I will pick on the, the example that you brought up a few times uh, here. And, and First, let me start. I think that women have an advantage a little bit in overcoming obstacles. Um, and I, I think the reason why I believe this is that I think we thrive in relationship building and in resourcefulness. And oftentimes that's that's just the name of the game. Um, and I, I've found those two things to be essential in tackling challenges. And so having worked in our family's business for more than 13 years, you know, I can certainly recall times as I'm sure my other family members who are involved can as well, you know, those times where you felt like you just had to outwork, outperform, right, to really earn your place here, because the perception um, that will easily go into place is that people will just assume you're there because you're in the family. Right. And your, your education, your work experience, it, it may not carry as much weight as consistently demonstrating that you're willing to walk the walk and put in the time and be there for your, your team. Um, so, you know, I, I look to my resourcefulness, I look to my relationships outside of STAR to help offer me guidance and perspective. And I just think that's so important to surround yourself with those mentors or coaches who, you know, they will be the ones that smack you in the face when you need a smack in the face, a wake up call, uh, make you laugh until you cry, or just be there to listen, be a cheerleader. So I, I think we have to, don't underestimate the importance of who those confidence confidants are because mm -hmm. they will help they've certainly helped me realize my strength and, and they just push me to reach so much higher yeah I think I, one, one thing you just said just really hit me I think all of us as women have experienced where you feel like you have to do 150 percent for them to judge that you're doing 100 percent you know and um 
it's irritating at times. You feel like this isn't fair, but you know, but it's, it's what you have to do, you know, to, you know, to, uh, to move on up. Um, okay, next, Amanda, what have you <clears throat> run into and as a challenge or some, some kind of obstacle, you know, you know, even before the Museum of Art, but what, what have you run into and how'd you get over it, you know, as a woman? Uh, well, I may have a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I'm 36, so I was raised with the expectation that I would go to college and would get a job. And um, marriage and family was not necessarily an expectation for my life. It's not that it was, you know, don't do that. But I think, you know, maybe growing up in the 90s and the 2000s, the number one expectation is that you will become a professional person. And I'm, I'm grateful for everything that I've been able to do. But at the same time, I think that expectation has come at the expense of, um, you know, my many other roles in life as a wife and a mother. And I have a lot of good friends who've chosen to raise their families exclusively and they've not chosen to work. They've ha they have four-year degrees and, you know, there's kind of a social denigration to that. And I'm really yes. troubled by that because I really respect and admire these women who've sacrificed their own hopes and dreams, at least for a time for the benefit of their family. So maybe we've swung a little bit too far in, in, in that pendulum swing and, and, you know, the two don't have to come at the expense of the other, or, you know, one choice doesn't have to be seen in such total contrast to the other. So, um, coming up, coming up maybe, you know, in the eighties and the nineties and the two thousands, maybe I've seen things a little bit differently. Um, that seems to be a common thread. Um, we need to talk afterwards. I want to tell you a quick story about my 12 year old son when I decided I wasn't going to work and I was going to stay home and take him to soccer and cook cookies and what he said to me. I uh, will talk afterwards. And it was, good. A, it was like a bucket of cold water. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> you know, God bless them if they want to be home, but don't do that to yourself. Okay. Because you're a tremendous example to your children you know, and they're more proud of you than you realize. We'll talk about it later. Okay, great. Um, Councilwoman Tucker, I bet you've overcome an obstacle or two in your life. <laughs> yes. One or two, one or two. First, I have to say when Amanda said the um, 80s and the 90s, Amanda, my daughter, who at the time I think was seven, she looked at me and she says, hey, mom, did they have color TV when you were growing up, you know, in the 80s and the 90s? <laughs> Yes. I wanted to tell her, get out of here, kid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So just how old do you think I am? <laughs> I know. I know. So when I heard Amanda say that, it, it made me think of that. When she said it to me, I just chuckled in my heart like, yes, they had color TV when I was a kid. <laughs> right. um, so have I any, any challenges? Absolutely. Um, just being a Black female that's a Democrat in, in, in the community, um, every day presents an opportunity for me to be able to show love. And that's how I'd like to leave it, right? To be able to show love to individuals. I remember one time someone asked me, real, real good friend too, asked me, well, if you're campaigning, who's going to keep your kids while you're out campaigning? Oh, dear Lord, yes. And I looked at him and I kind of squared him up, you know, sized him up to see if I could take him down. <laughs> and then I said to him, the same person who's keeping the other people's kids while they campaign. You know, it's that reality that we have to share with guys, um, especially when they, oh, yeah. when they attempt to um, box us, to put us in a box that we oh, yeah. should not, should not be in. When I walk into a room, um, it's just part of who I am. I, I kind of hang to the back. I like to look around and see if I see an individual that's there by themselves and go try to cozy up and friend up to them. And I was in a room recently where I was talking to a guy and he just kind of, you know, did, he wasn't mean, but he wasn't warm. And when someone else just came up and said, Councilwoman Tucker, his entire atmosphere, oh, his yes. whole aura changed. 
And at that point in time, I was kind of over him because <laughs> the councilwoman Tucker shouldn't have to make a difference in order for a person to treat you kind or be nice. And my mom had raised us to be kind to everybody because you never know when you're hosting an angel. And I took that to heart. And so whether it is Councilwoman Tucker or someone who's not Councilwoman, my whole goal in any kind of um, area of diversity is first to just love on the person, understand what their pain points are, and then help them realize that regardless of whatever title you think I have, I want the same thing you want. We want to have a safe place to be, a safe place to live. I want to be able to feed my kid. I want to be able to send them to school. And how we do that makes a difference to me. Wonderful. Boy, I think we can all identify with some of that. You just, I loved it. I'm just over this guy. Yeah. I go through this too, of course. Are you an old, you know, you're an old woman. Oh, you're the CEO of KPC Media, the most powerful media company in the region. Oh, hi. You know, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yes. We can all identify. Um, oh, that's wonderful, Sharon. Thank you for sharing. Rebecca, tell us a challenge. Engineering, men, holy moly. You look very young. You know, tell us a challenge that you've run into, a roadblock, and how you got over it. Yeah, uh, there's been a couple. Uh, <laughs> I bet. There's, yeah, throughout pretty much, I will take a step back and say that I've been very lucky where I've had so many supportive people in my life. My family, my parents, they've all been very, like, pro um, all of my choices with going into engineering. So I've had them be a great support. And I've had amazing mentors and um, support and friends at work too. But there have been some stinkers along the way who have felt the need to vocalize that they don't think I deserve a spot at the table. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately. So I am younger for my profession. Um, I think there's about a few decades between me and the next person closest in age to me. They're all men. Um, and that does, uh, even though I have some amazing coworkers, it does come up. Um, I have been straight up told that um, by not a direct coworker, but a peripheral one, that I had my position because they needed to check a box for diversity. Um, I have been regularly, people were flabbergasted that I could be a professor. They always want to put me in more of a support role. Um, so even when I, they are straight up introduced to me as a professor, their brains just do not accept it for some reason. And we'll be like, no, 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 you're, you're like the, you know, a secretary or, you know, something like that. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've had that happen a lot. Um, so how do you get over that? How do you get through that? How do you, you know, what do you do? My biggest thing is in the moment, I always try to still be as professional as possible. I think, you know, my gut reaction is usually honestly embarrassment. Um, and I like a lot of times will inside shrink back a little, but I think it's important to still maintain professionalism in those circumstances and address it straight on. Um, Thankfully, because I have so many amazing friends, family at work uh, and in my environment, usually my tactic is after the fact, I vent a little, get it out of my system and then move on um, and just keep, you know, chugging away. Sometimes it's easier said than done. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's otherwise it'll just bury you if you um, if you let it get to you. Uh, so I think it, it is good to have that vent session, allow yourself to feel those emotions and address them. And then just keep going back to kicking butt when you can. So um, I think, though, like the biggest roadblock that I face regularly is actually with myself. Um, I am quite often my own self-doubter. And I think it is because I have heard things as I've been moving through my career, little like snide comments and stuff that I have internalized those. And I quite often when there's an opportunity that will come up, you know, maybe applying for an award or a new position, promotions, um, to sit on a special committee, my gut reaction is usually, oh, I'm not qualified for that. Or, oh, there's so many people that are more qualified than me. They'll obviously get it. And I'm so lucky. It's my department chair in particular, um, who's my direct supervisor. And he often 
he's a very close friend and he will often like yell at me and say like, make them say no, do not say no for them. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Make them say no. Yeah, I make love them that. say no, you know, put your application forward. And then the worst thing that happens is they do say no and it's okay. And then you try again in the future, you know, like that's okay. Um, and so, so thank you for so sharing important. that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that so much. That's really, really meaningful. Sharon, what's an obstacle you've run into? Again, a very male-dominated ownership industry, you know, insurance, you know, what's an obstacle you've run into? Like, you know, even like I noticed you're on a, a statewide insurance, uh, you know, board or something. What have you run into and how have you gotten past it? Uh, the insurance industry is predominantly a male uh, industry, and it has been for years and years and years. Um, the, I guess the best way to describe it is I've just persevered. I've just said, okay, there's a spot for me somewhere. And so I would put myself out there and say, I will volunteer, volunteer to do this if you need me to help. And before you know it, those seem to come along and then just morph into uh, opportunities. And I have built my career around that thought process that you're never going to get anywhere unless you put yourself out there. It's been hard and it's been a long process, but um, probably the one thing that stuck with me the most, and I have looked back on this quite a bit here recently, is when I was uh, probably 17 coming downstairs, I was still living at home to go to work. And again, remember, I was working and going to school at the same time in high school. And my dad looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you're going to own an agency someday. And I just thought... Sorry, um, I thought, no, that won't happen, oh. but, um, but it did. So yeah. the mentors I have had along the way have been uh, my, the four owners of the agency prior to myself, who, as I said before, were all family members. And right. then the last one who was not, but they just gave me the confidence. They gave me the abilities. They gave me the strings to just take, or the reins, I should say, to just plow forward and um, groomed me to be where I am today. And I am forever, ever, ever in their debt. Um, but it's also but, inside of you. I mean, you've got to be tough enough to do it and keep pushing yourself forward too. You know, exactly. all of us are strong. And that comes from family, that comes from friends, that comes from everybody. Coworkers especially yeah. have been predominantly a, a very big highlight in my career. Um, I've had wonderful people surrounding yeah. me all these years. So it's, it's been, yeah, Great. I would highly recommend that process for anyone who is looking to just move forward. Right. Yeah. Believe in yourself. We've had a couple of questions. The first question is, um, have you ever dealt with, had to deal with uh, sexual harassment in the workplace? And if so, how have you dealt with it? Let's, let's start off. Let's go back to Sherry. Sherry, have you run into it or dealt with it or? How have you dealt with it or have you been lucky to not be affected by that? Uh, well, actually, uh, early in my career, so I feel like I'm probably much older than most of you on this panel, but um, early in my career, I did face that. I was actually working in the insurance industry, so Susan, I'm sure you can relate to some of the things that happened, but uh, did face that, uh, faced it head on though, uh, and uh, took it to HR. I was young at the time, took it to HR and, and, and dealt with it. So you just have to be willing to have those crucial conversations. And I know for young girls uh, entering the workforce, it's, it's a difficult, uh, difficult skill to learn. Um, but I think as mentors, all of us that have been through it or experienced it, you know, we can help them uh, develop the skills to have those crucial conversations and not be afraid to speak up when they're uncomfortable and not to feel like it's their fault and that they deserved it. Right, Kristen, how about you? Uh, I fortunately have not directly experienced it. I, I've, I've certainly had some friends who have. Um, I don't know that I have anything um, enlightening to add in addition to what she has just shared um, other than just you know, the willingness to speak up, right? Don't, don't sit on it. Don't think it's gonna go away on its own. And so right. have the courage to, to say something because it's not okay. Yeah, how about you, Amanda? Uh, I have not personally dealt with it, but 
um, to any major extent. I mean, you always get people commenting on your looks, like, um, you know, I, I don't really mind if somebody compliments my outfit or says you look nice, but you know, we don't run around telling men they look handsome in the workplace as much as I think women get told they look beautiful or, mm-hmm. you know, um, again, I don't mind a compliment, but it's, it's like, why that doesn't need to be, why is that such a forward, you know, attribute of what I bring you, to the that workplace you think is okay, um, that you think is okay to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had to manage a couple of minor cases in my mm-hmm. career and thankfully they've been, you know, taken care of quickly. So I, I have observed it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Miss um, Tucker, have you run into, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace or no, not too nah, much? I think they just take one look at me and say, don't even try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rebecca, how about you? Do you run into any? Thankfully, no. Um, But I guess my one piece of advice is to trust your instinct. Um, If something feels icky, it's probably icky. And so don't feel like, you know, get all up in your head thinking you're overreacting. Uh, Talk to someone about it because odds are good you're not overreacting. Yeah. And how about you? And also, you know, if if someone's doing something unpleasant towards you that making you feel icky, you're not the first time they've done it. You know, it's, you know, this is a pattern right? So, you know, don't blame yourself. Susan, have you ever, did you ever, you know, deal with this uh, people flirting away at a convention or whatever, or acting inappropriate that you had to deal with? Uh, just a couple of times. Uh, we had a couple of company adjusters that would come in, and this was when I was a lot younger. Um, they were probably a little more forward looking back than what they should have been. Mm-hmm. Again, those days, you just didn't think much of it, um, you know, but looking back, that probably was my closest um, exposure to anything of that nature, well, that's but good. it was dealt with and it didn't go any further. Thank goodness. So. It, it's unfortunately something that women do deal with a lot. Well, listen, this has been terrific. Absolutely wonderful talk, you guys. Um, Amanda, don't let those women influence you. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and share this story really quickly for the video too, for our audience. So. Um, I've been working mo- all of my children's lives, uh, as a, a lot of it as a single mother, and then I uh, decided I was going to become a consultant and I was going to work part-time, and I came home and announced to my 12-year-old son, after I'd been in the newspaper business his whole life, mom's only going to work half-time, I'm going to pick you up from soccer, and I'm going to bake cookies, and you know we're not going to be doing laundry at two in the morning, and he goes, what? What? You're going to be home like other mothers? You mean like that lady that plays tennis and has that bracelet? And I go, yeah, I'm going to be home. He goes, he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. He goes, you're in the news business. You do all these things. You, you chase the police. You do this. And I'm like, okay, the child didn't even want me home, you know? And it was a shock to me. He was proud of me. Amanda, your children are proud of you. I picked my children up early from school the other day. I was actually out of town and I thought I wouldn't be home until dinner time. And I surprised them at 3 p.m. And my daughter was mad and said, I wanted to stay at aftercare and play at school. Why are you here so early? So I think you're right. Exactly. (laughs) Leave me alone. I'm fine. You know, get over the guilt. Right. Guys, thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. And then in our second hour, we're so excited to have with us. I just have to find it. Let me find the page. Um, Andy Hines Lagerman, um, Shanna Bradley, Virginia Richardson, um, Juanita Ray, um, Nicole Keister, uh, Madeline Sa- uh, Sade Bartle, uh, Nyla Duffett, Sharon Hughes, and T. Cook. So we're very excited. In our second hour, we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. Grab a cup of coffee. And um, we'll be back on and live in a few minutes, okay? Thank you for our first group. Everybody be sure, if you don't get any of our papers and got the section, it will be on our any KPC News website or in FW Business later today or by the end of this week. Thank you, guys. We'll see you the next group in a few minutes. At Thank 12. you.
Smooth out my skin. <laughs> Hi. Okay, we're getting ready to go here in our second hour. So, well, hi everybody. Um, welcome back to Influential Women of Northeast Indiana live chat today. Um, let me just, we got, um, I think we got everybody on. We're missing one person who's having trouble getting on the call and She's on now. Okay, great. Andy's on. Great. Okay. Um, welcome to our live chat, Influential Women of Northeast Indiana. We just had a fabulous first hour. So um, this is being brought to you by KPC Media Group and sponsored by Tilde Multimedia Firm. My main name is Lou Phelps. I'm CEO of the company, and I'm serving as the moderator of this live chat event. For those of you just joining us over the next hour, you'll have the opportunity to hear from eight interesting and diverse women who have made an impact in their career, field, and in nonprofit organizations in our local region, many of whom have overcome obstacles and difficult uh, odds to do so. Our eight women in our this next hour are Andy Hines Logman from Tidewater Coaching, Sh um, Shanna Bradley from Journey Birth and Wellness, Virginia Richardson from Tide. Uh, Tidal Tilde Multimedia Firm, Juanita Ray from El Azteca Restaurant. We have four women who are the make up the executive board of the Cherubusco Chamber of Commerce: Nicole Keister, uh, Madeline S uh, Sade Bartle, Nila uh, Nila Duffett, and um, and Sarah Hughes with Star Bank. And that's really unusual to have four women running a chamber of commerce in our area. And last but not least, joining us in the second hour will be T. Cook of All in One Events. So um, we're going to start off that, you know, we believe that their stories will inspire you. Um, we'd also appreciate if you would consider um, sharing your Facebook page today, um, if you're on it with Facebook, uh, so that more women can be brought to this conversation. And as you watch the video, which will be um, available for the next year, um, share it with your Facebook and, and just bring more women to this conversation. We're holding this event, not, this event in October because women is Women in Business Month, celebrated nationally and celebrated here at KPC Media Group. As many of you know, uh, we're the publisher of daily and weekly newspapers in your community. Uh, last week, we published a special section um, about all these women with their great stories if you don't get one of our papers and haven't read it, it will be on KPC News and on FW Business later this week, and you can read it very easily. With each of the women are going to tell you a little bit about their careers and how they got started, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges um, you know, that everybody goes through being women in business. So let's start off with Andy. Um, Andy, our first question, which I have to find, give me a moment here. No, I've been doing this for umpteen years. Okay. And where did I put the first question? Here it is. Our first question is the core purpose of this event when we envisioned it was to inspire women to progress in their career, to hear how other women have started or bought a business or got promoted in their job. Um, and um, we also want to expand our audience's network of potential members, uh, mentors, but we're women. And we know that brings some different dynamics to the workplace. So we'd like you each to first um, talk a minute or so with the audience about how um, you got started in your business and then we'll come back to some questions. So um, first of all, tell us a little bit about your job, who you are, what you do and how you got started. And we're sure. gonna start off with Andy. Sure, thanks so much for having me and uh, for this honor Andy? today. You're mute. Andy, you're on mute. Andy, you gotta unmute. Muted. Can you hear okay. me now? Can we hear Andy? Can you guys hear Andy? Okay. Can we hear her? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Andy. How'd you get to tell us about your job and how you got started? Yep. Uh, so I spent uh, 20 years in marketing and corporate events. And during 2020, all of my events evaporated into thin air. And so I had a moment of deciding what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, and 
decided with some self-reflection that what I really love the most and what gives me the most energy is helping other people. So last year, a little over a year ago, I became an emotional intelligence practitioner. And now I am getting my master's of psychology through Indiana Wesleyan, uh, which is very intense, but amazing. And um, so, yeah, uh, just some of the, the challenges, the questions that you brought up, uh, and of course they emailed us ahead of time, so I was prepared, but um, I, I first wanna say, and, and this came up in conversation at a, another event earlier this week, that first and foremost, um, I don't first think of myself as a woman in this role, I think of myself as a professional at what I do. And so, um, you know, that being said, I don't want to like not acknowledge the challenges that women face um, and the, the barriers, the, you know, we, there is a different dynamic there for us, I think certainly. Um, but when I am going out and, you know, winning a corporate contract for coaching or working with a one-on-one -on -one client, I don't approach it like as a woman or because I'm a woman, I approach it because I'm a really good practitioner. Um, and I know that. So, um, hey. Thanks, Andy. Okay, we're going to go to Shan uh, Shanna Bradley of Journey Birth and Wellness. So tell us a little bit about your business, how you got into it. Okay. Yeah, so I'm a wife and a mother of five kids and uh, starting out in healthcare straight out of high school. And I had my first son and it was very traumatic. And I didn't even realize how traumatic until my second came along. And his birth was untraumatic. It was nothing to think much of like it was just beautiful and so working in the healthcare field i thought what made those two hospital births so drastically different so i started doing research and i just had a heart and passion for birth work and eventually transitioned into that as a birth doula and um, i also have a heart for internationals and refugees and cross-cultural and we were living out of the area working with internationals and refugees in the most diverse square mile in america and um, God really called us back to Indiana after hearing the infant and maternal mortality rates here in the Fort Wayne area and throughout Indiana being um, the top three and top five for those things was just heartbreaking to me. So we moved back to the area to start working with underserved and marginalized communities through birth work to be able to reduce, hopefully have an impact on reduction of maternal and infant mortality. And uh, so that's what literally how we birthed Journey Birth and Wellness as a non for profit to come alongside those women, as well as train and equip women from those communities highest at risk to be able to be the birth professionals within their own communities. Wonderful. We look forward to hearing more as we get into questions this hour. Next, Virginia from um, Tilde Multimedia Firm. Tell us a little bit about your business and how you got into it. Hi, I'm Virginia from Tilda. It's Tilda Multimedia. Um, Tilda. A lot of people say Tilde, but it's Tilda and the Tilda. Um, symbol is actually the little accent on your keyboard that first squiggly line that's the tilde mark and it means approximately perfect or almost equals to um but i started out um as a intern and i was working for viacom and i just really loved um technology and being creative and i i, I just ended up getting laid off because i was always a manager and you know when, when they have um when they start cutting the budget, the managers are always the first to go. So that's when I just started to, decided to move back to Fort Wayne and start my business. And I just learned everything from the different Fortune 500 companies that I worked at and brought it back here. And now I'm just trying to serve my communities and help businesses grow. That's wonderful. We we'll look forward to learning more about you and hearing more about your life. Juanita Ray from El Azteca Restaurant. Tell us how you got started in the restaurant business and owning a very successful restaurant here in Fort Wayne, working with people. Tell us a little bit about you and your business. You're on mute. There you go. Take it off. You're still on mute. There you go. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hello. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I actually had some great, just like all the other ladies, I had some great people guiding me. And uh, I was a good listener and a hard worker. I still am, but um, they, 
the the love for the hospitality started at Azar's on Calhoun Street across from Southside High School. I was a car hop there. And <laughs> I was a car hop and that got into my system and I wanted to quit high school and my dad said no. <laughs> Smart man. And um, but from that point on, I just the hospitality was it. And uh, that's where I'm at now, you know, and um, I did, I did um, out of high school, I got a, I got I, one resume to my life and that was for St. Joseph Hospital in 1960. And oh my goodness. I, I was there for 14 years and three months. <laughs> and so I had the poor handmaids of Jesus Christ were the nuns that were running the hospital at the time. And they taught me a lot about life and business. So that was my college right there. Wow, terrific. How many years old is is um is the restaurant now? Well, I've owned it since 1973. So wow. November 3rd will be would have would be 48 years. Wow, Anita, isn't that a great Fort Wayne story? Yay! Yes. Yes. Owned business. That is fabulous. Well, we look Thank forward you. to hearing more about you in this hour. Okay, okay, now you can see on your screen these the great women of the Cherubusco Chamber of Commerce, which we are so excited to have them with us. Of course, KPC, we own the Cherubusco News and um, the Post and Mail in Whitley County and publish every week and twice a week with the Post and Mail. With us um, on this Cherubusco Chamber of Commerce Executive Board is Nicole Keister, Nicole with 46 Graphics, Oh, actually, she's, she's not here. Sorry. Not here she, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Madeline Say Bartle, the clerk and treasurer. Yay. Um, Neela Duffett of Duffett and Associates. Who's Neela? Nice. Yeah. And, um, and Sarah Hughes with Star Bank. Yay. Great. So um, will each of you just tell us a little bit about your business experience and just getting involved in, in creating and improving the Cherubusco Chamber of Commerce. And having a woman board. Um, so I guess I'll start. My name is Madeline Say Bartle. I'm the, I am the clerk treasurer of the town of Cherubusco and have served in that role since 2012. Um, I've also served as vice president of the chamber since 2016, but I've been on the executive board or the executive committee for since 2014, I believe. Um, so I think I'm the longest serving board member out of the three of it. Well, actually, all four of us that are, serve as the um, executive members. Uh, so I will hand it off to Sarah. Well, let's go back though for a quick second. Oh, okay. so you're elected to office, right? I am, yes. Yes, so so tell us very briefly, quickly, because a lot of us think about running for office at times in our careers or people encourage us. What made you run for office the first time? Um, my aunt conned me into it. <laughs> <laughs> she was a town council member and um, there was an opening for the clerk treasurer position um, and she, I had just recently moved back to Cherubusco and she recommended that I that I run and I won actually against an incumbent um, and Ooh. been doing this since. So um, I think, yeah, I feel like we've definitely done a lot of revitalization in the Cherubusco area since 2012. Um, I hope that I have just a small part in making sure that that happened, but um, that's really my aunt asked me to run and I had the call to serve and, and here I am today. That's great. Sarah from Star Bank, tell us about that, the banking business. Always busy. Always busy, yes. I've been with the bank for 18 years, I'm always here at the Cherubusco branch of Star Bank. I've been a branch manager for about 10 years, and I um, actually went to school for electrical engineering, um, but I, I was at a restaurant. I was a server at a restaurant that closed down. And uh, while I was looking for a job, a friend had recommended Star Bank. I'm from Cherubusco and uh, the, the star here in Cherubusco had an opening. So I started out as a teller and worked my way up to the branch manager position. Wonderful. And how many years have you been branch manager? About 10. Wonderful. Terrific. Terrific. Well, great. So uh, Neela, Neela Duffett of Duffett um, and Associates, tell us about you and your company. Yeah, my name is Nyla Duffett. Oh, Nyla, sorry. That's okay. Um, 
And uh, Duffet and Associates um, actually um, just been around for two years, uh, but it's uh, my husband, uh, his business, he had worked for another um, tax company in uh, Columbia City for 25 years and decided to buy that uh, business. And so uh, we changed the name to Duffet and Associates two years ago. So that is uh, fairly new for me, but it's a business that my husband's been in for over 25 years. Um, and so I help him out uh, as marketing director. She laughs uh, because I don't get paid much. Um, <laughs> I don't get paid at all. <laughs> so, um, but, um, so I help him out. My full-time job is as a missionary. I've been a missionary for over 25 years with a ministry called Worldwide Discipleship Association. Currently serve as the chief publishing editor for a WDA um, in the ministry. So I kind of juggle both the full-time job plus helping my husband in the business. I have a desire to serve and serve the community. And so decided the, the Chair Busco Chamber was a great way to do that. And so I've just been on uh, the board just this year as treasurer. So this is my first year. Wonderful. And I, I just want to say, at least with us yeah. three, we um, all three are Chair Busco High School graduates. Oh. Um, and uh, I know that at least with Nyla and myself, we were out of the area for quite a few years and decided to come back and, and call Busco home. Yeah, so it's one of the great things about Chair Busco. It's a really <laughs> tight community and it's, you know, it's really wonderful. The whole Whitley County is just, it's just really been great for us to publish in and know, so get, get to meet so many great people. You know, it's really been terrific. Um, okay, uh, next is uh, T. Talk to us, T. Cook, um, all in one um, events. And um, is T on the screen? Where's T? Is she off the call? Yeah. Okay, T's off the call. Then we'll move on. Um, technology is what it is. Um, so let's start with our first question. As I said, our core purpose of this event when we envisioned it was to inspire women to progress in their career, to hear how other women have started or bought a business or got promoted in their job and to expand our audience's network of potential members. But we're women. And that brings some different dynamics to the workplace. We'd like uh, each of you to take a minute or so and talk with your audience, talk with our audience about how you've juggled work and your personal life as you were building your career, how you financed your higher education while you were working, if you did so, et cetera. So talk to us about, you know, working, you know, juggling a family, you know, certainly we need a, you know, difficult industry, the hospitality restaurant business, all of you are, you know, we've all had challenges. In, in, whether you're in ministry, nonprofit work, you still, it's work and people demanding things of you, but you got a family at home that wants to eat. So, you know, and the laundry's got to get done. So let's, let's uh, start off um, with Andy. Andy, you know, how have you juggled all this? Um, well, sometimes less gracefully than others. Let's just <laughs> own that right off the bat. Um, but one of the things that I actually coach uh, coach on, and some people on this call might have actually even heard me give this presentation that I very strongly coach against the concept of work life balance. I think it creates a very unrealistic um, perception of how we should operate. It's this visual of a scale and the family and the kids, and maybe yourself on one side and work on the other side. And if the kids need attention, then you're like a negligent employee. And if work needs attention, attention than like the children are suffering. And I just think this is a horrible standard to try to live up to. There's all kinds of guilt and shame and yuck wrapped up in all of that. And so I coach on work-life blending. And I always say we are grown professional responsible adults and we are able to decipher when something needs to be a priority and be taken care of. And when it is, we switch back to the other thing that needs our attention. And, you know, at the end of the day, kind of releasing ourselves from all of the, the guilt about um, paying attention to one thing or another and not something else. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's gross. And I'm trying to summarize it into one minute, but I do like a whole coaching on this. Do you um, coach, do you coach spouses and significant others? <laughs> that we shouldn't feel guilty. <laughs> I can for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Shanna Bradley of, of Journey Birth and Wellness, five children. 
How do you juggle all of this? You know, someone's going to give birth. Sorry, it's your play, but I've got to go because I made a commitment to this person. How do you juggle this all? Yeah, so our oldest is 16 and our youngest will be five tomorrow and we have everything in between and we homeschool. So that's the biggest challenge. And I love what she just said about blending. Um, that's a perfect word. So I do majority of my work from home. Um, we also do have an office, but birth is unscheduled. So it, you have to be really flexible. So what I have learned as far as homeschooling is we have specific homeschooling hours. So unless it's like a birth emergency or there's something, you know, a birth happening, um, those are like sacred hours for the most part so that that work can get done. And then after that um, is a lot of mom being busy with, with work. Um, and I try, so I use a app on my phone, which has been super helpful in the last year working so much from home, um, where I clock in and clock out for the nonprofit so that I can visually see when, Hey, I put in oh. six, seven, eight, 10 hours today. Like it's okay to like step away, um, to be able to find that, that ability to say no for myself. Um, and, and to blend that. And so I think that's been super helpful as a visual person because I don't have someone as an executive director, I don't have someone saying like, you have to be here so many hours or do this or stop doing this and take a break. So- You already um, put in 11 hours, you know, yeah, stuff yeah. already, yeah. Right, and births can be a couple hours or I had a birth recently that was on and off for four days. And so finding that flexibility of like, okay, I can, you know, spend some more time in this area. And, and like she said, blend is, is such a perfect word. I love it. Wow, wow, that is really something. Virginia Richardson, um, Tilda Multimedia Firm, how have you blended work and you know personal and all this stuff that women in the workplace, our life is just different? Yeah, well, I, um, I don't have a family as far as children, but for me, um, it's a little different because work is my life and I've had to learn sometimes to shut it off. <laughs> because I'll keep going and going and going and going. And basically what I do is, is digital. So it's, you know, it's always, it, technology never turns off. Um, and I've ever, I've also had to go through some um, obstacles with um, dealing with some issues with my health because I'm not getting enough rest. And I've had to learn to say, okay, the phone gets cut off at, you know, this time, I'm going to turn my ringer off. Um, it's just learning, especially when I first started at Viacom, I was the on-air promotions manager. So it was my responsibility to make sure that everything that was on air ran at the right time. So I would wake up at three, four o'clock in the morning and just make sure that spot ran. And I mean, this is something that's been going on for 20 years. So finally, <laughs> you know, I've had to learn, okay, shut it off, Virginia. You have to rest because if you don't rest, you're going to spend that time recovering from being sick from not getting the rest so I've just learned you know you have to turn it off sounds like Shanna's simple. app is something you ought to look into yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean I deal with it too in the news yeah. business there's no nine to five it's 24 exactly. 7, 365 um sometimes I shut my phone off like on Saturday and then my grown children call me when I finally turn it back on and they're like mom we've been trying to call you all day and I go well, I turned the phone off because I had yeah. to not talk to the world for a few hours. You know, we have to control ourselves and it's hard. It is. You know, Shanna, you can't. I mean, you just, you don't know when something's going to happen. So we're all dealing with a lot. That's really interesting though, Virginia. I mean, I think we're all dealing, I think all women do, you know, we tend to do 150% or otherwise we're guilty that we're not doing enough, right? I mean, we, we deal with that. Um, Juanita, how have you juggled life? And, you know, I mean, the restaurant business is tough, man. And if the restaurant's not open, you're cleaning it or the vendors are showing up and the products are coming and the employees are quitting and you're interviewing and, you know, what? how have you juggled over all these years? Controlled chaos. <laughs> That's the way chaos. I can describe it. Um, it's, it's, it's rewarding and it's, it's um, exciting. You meet pe new people every day. Uh, you stay in touch with them. You know, you teach. I've had a lot of employees that came through here and I've taught them and, not, and some went on to do their own business. And that to me is rewarding. And I love this, I love the business. I just love the interaction with, with the customers, with the vendors, uh, we have a few little disagreements with the vendors once in a while but you know those those <laughs> all of that is 
exciting to me and uh, keeps me going. <laughs> it's amazing. So, have you raised a family with children? I have. I'm the eldest of 14 children. What? So, yes, I'm the eldest of 14 children. So I had to learn from the very beginning how to survive. <laughs> and um, I. Um, how inspirational. That wasn't in your story. We missed I that. Know. Our reporter missed that. Darn. Yes, and and um, I have one daughter. I look have at the one look at everybody's face. We're all like. <laughs> uh, I was the. You know, I had to help my family uh, survive. I, this, the late 50s and the early 60s. Sure. And uh, so as the kids kept coming, I, I just uh, got myself a part-time job, an extra part-time job to make ends meet to help my mom and my dad who were hardworking. I, I have their worth it, work ethic and I'm thankful for that. And uh, with that, there's no stopping me. You just so you have one daughter. So you have one daughter. One daughter. So all the years that you were raising her, did she like mom stop? You know, come home from the restaurant. How did that go? Actually, um, she was. We were already in business in seventy three, and she came three years later. So, for nine months, she came with me, and then I could not contain her here. You know, so uh, <laughs> I had I found an angel that lived two doors down, Carol Hamsoff, and she took my little girl and, oh. and she was part of the family. In fact, she says, mom, she is my second mom. So, but now that she is the, now that Christina is older, she understands that I was actually away for a reason and to make it sure. in the business. So Absolutely. she understands it now. Yeah, well, great, thank you. Madeline, how about you? I mean, how did you, you know, have you, how you juggled, I mean, clerk treasurer and the political life and everybody in town knows you and you go to the grocery store and they're complaining, I, I about, don't, their tax no, bill. The they're complaining about their tax bill there's yeah, you know yeah. yeah so how have you juggled you know work and personal life and all that um not well um <laughs> <laughs> not well uh, it, I, honestly i mean my kids ever since i first ran for election in 20 the fall of 2011, my kids were with me. I was pushing my daughter in a stroller. She was a year and a half old. Um, my son was, you know, toddling around behind me as he was four years old. And I mean, they were going knocking door to door when, you know, they were just toddlers. And since then, um, they have been, everybody in the chamber knows who they are because they, they are expected to help with every single event. Um, they go and they pull weeds downtown if I, see that something needs weeded or trash needs picked up. Um, they're my little community helpers. Um, and now they're teenagers and uh, they they try to argue a lot about not wanting to do things, but um, we have an event going on on Saturday for the chamber and they will be out there on Saturday morning, whether they like it or not, <laughs> helping to set up. So, um, yeah. so I mean, I think getting them involved and I, they, they've grown up in Cherubusco and they know how important it is to be active in the community and right. um, they see the importance of volunteerism and they see the importance of what, um, you know, Cherubusco Chamber is doing, the town of Cherubusco is doing to build that better community and build better relationships with both our residents and our businesses. Wonderful. Sarah, how have you juggled work and family or husband and, you know, dogs and all these things are older parents yeah, or yeah. <laughs> older about, parents not as well as madeline <laughs> um i don't juggle it well no i i have a very extremely supportive family and i also work for for an amazing company that understands it that star bank is a family-owned company so they understand that families most of the time come first as well so i'm very thankful for both my family and the company and it, it's just been that i um there's not a lot of times that i have to do work outside of quote unquote normal business hours so i'm very thankful for that um which also then gives me time to help out with other things in the community the chamber and and other events going on around town it sounds like also you're going to be very understanding of women employees, particularly who've got children and 
you know, their husband wants them to be and expects them home. I mean, you know, you're going to be very, you know, understanding in the management role that you absolutely. Have. Oh, yes. It, we yes. It, with the company that passes down, I think just about every branch or location that that does pass down as well. And I, I have that complete um, trust with my staff. They they have appointments and kids need picked up from school and kid got sick three minutes from leaving from the house. Oh, it yeah. happens. We've all been there, done that. It's okay. Yeah. Nyla, how about you? How have you juggled your uh, the ministry and, and the work and helping your husband out? Was he trying to own this business himself and expects you down there, but then dinner's not ready? How have you juggled all, juggled all this? Take out. <laughs> <laughs> Take out food. <laughs> Supporting small businesses in Cherubusca. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eating out, no. Um, no, really. Um, Ministry-wise, um, has been always, um, it's not a nine to five. Um, no. So um, ministry was my life for several years. Um, I didn't get married until I was in my mid-30s. So I did ministry um, as a single gal for a long time and then did get married. And so, yes, just learning how to handle the fact that okay now i have a family after i had been established for so long um was a challenge but um but a joy in the sense too and i i am grateful i'm kind of like sarah and i have a ministry that is very very supportive of family um because it is ministry and so it's very flexible i was able to take care of my mom when she was ill for several years and had the flexibility in my job to be able to do that and I'm very grateful for that. And so, um, and yes, now with the business, um, it has added an additional challenge and I'm still trying to determine how to help my husband as best I can in the new business uh, with also, also working take a break time. yourself. You gotta take a break yourself too. Yes, yeah, exactly. you touched on older parents, which I think a lot of us, you know, deal with that type of thing too. Okay, let's move on to our second question. Um, most women working outside the home in a career have run into roadblocks. Um, it might have been a terrible boss or a person who didn't view you as capable of moving up the ladder um, or being in charge, or it might have been you that you didn't view yourself as able to do what you thought you know you wanted to do. Um, it could be your family not always supportive. Would you share with us a challenge that you've run into and how you got past it? Was there a minute? Was there a mentor that lifted you up? A book? A, a life coach? I mean, how'd you get through a challenge? So let's start off with um, Andy, the life coach. You know, what's a, what's a challenge that you've run into in your career and, you know, that people could identify with and how'd you get past it? Well, I mean, again, I think we've all run into um, sexism and being passed over for roles that we were certainly qualified for. Um, but I would say, uh, really the biggest challenges for me um, have been back in 2014, uh, I had cervical cancer and then my autoimmune system basically just shut down. And so I was very sick for about three years and of course not um, actively pursuing business at that time. It was all I could do to uh, sort of manage what was coming in on its own. So that was a huge challenge. Um, and then you know, next, won't we all be so glad when we don't ever have to speak the word COVID ever again? But uh, certainly last year when all my my events vanished into thin air, I was just like, okay, what is next? What does this look like? Um, and I'm still growing my business and trying to go to school at the same time. So um, in fact, if you saw the woman that was like walking around behind me a minute ago, this is one of my beautiful clients. We had a session right before this and I was like, my laptop's about to die. So she ran and plugged it in for me, but um, women supporting women, right? But yeah, Absolutely. I mean, um, so cancer and then COVID and then just navigating this career change, growing my practice, my clients. And you decided to go back and get more education, mm -hmm. you know, to expand your professional credentials. Yeah, yep. No. Absolutely. Very, very. Yeah. Well, that's, that's very, very, very big. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Shanna, uh, journey, birth and wellness, you know, what's a challenge that you've run into or, you know, people perception of you or, you know, you know, um, maybe a client, you know, husband's not trusting you. The wife wants a doula and the husband is like, mm, I don't know, you know, talk to us about a challenge you've run into and that you've overcome. 
Yeah, I would say there's two big challenges that we have. One is um, community awareness. So uh, historically, doulas are looked at as a luxury and they're very expensive. So now we have the ability to make them accessible to any woman in Allen County and hopefully um, starting in January, anyone, um, even outside of Allen County. And so just community awareness of going into these communities, using our diverse doulas to speak up in their own communities, to share about education and support and breastfeeding. And really we're, we're kind of like adding a new element to a lot of these communities of um, they not knowing what a doula is. So I get asked all the time what a doula is. And um, so there's a lot of upfront education. And I think a challenge personally for me is being the executive director of a nonprofit was, it was never my plan. Um, I, I didn't sit there and say, I'm gonna you know start a non-for-profit. And so I don't have a background or education in that. And so it's been literally like self-taught and it has been a new thing after a new thing. I mean, and I wear all the hats. And so um, it's it's just challenging on a daily basis. Was it like you just felt like, I just got to step up and do this. I mean, we need this. We need to run an organization and there's nobody else to do it. Yeah. So I just got to step up and do it. Yeah. So we were looking and we, uh, my, my initial idea was I would work under another non-for-profit and just be, you know, under them. And there just wasn't one that aligned that was who believed in what we were doing. And so I didn't really have a choice. It was like, if this was going to get done, I, I just had to do it. And, um, and that's what I did. And so I just do it baby step at a time. So it's just one step. And then when that's done, I do the next thing and the next thing. And, and I don't really always know what I'm doing. I just do the next thing. Okay, great. Virginia, <laughs> life coaches have given you a thumbs up there. Virginia, uh, with um, Tilda Multimedia Firm, tell us a roadblock you've run into and, you know, even going back to like your Verizon days and, you know, and then how'd you get over it? Um, I would say a roadblock of mine is, you know, the family that I grew up in, you know, they believe in working hard, getting a job. And for me to start a business, it was a challenge because um, you know, they were like, well, why would you quit your job to start a business? And, you know, that's not what we do. You know, we're raised to work a nine to five. So for me, it's always been a challenge to be a self motivator or finding resources to go to the next level. Because, you know, sometimes as a business owner, you hit a plateau, especially if you don't have that mentor. But um, I will say that God has always placed people in my life. Even when I moved to DC, I didn't know a soul there. I just up and, and left in. The first person that I met was a lady who worked at the White House. And she was like, you know, do you have family here? And, and I told her no. And she was a very elegant, and intelligent lady. And she groomed me because, you know, I told her, you know, my role at Viacom and they had me going to different, um, you know, sponsorships. And, and I was the face sometimes of BET at events. So this lady groomed me and she taught me about business and, you know, how to hold your knife and, you know, which plate, you know, which plate to eat on next, you know, just different things like that. And even when I moved back here, um, I, um, I had already started my business and I went to build Seed Fort Wayne and Leslie Hill and Michelle Chambers, they, they were my mentors here. So it's just like, wherever I go, it just always works out. Like it's in the plan. So I, I never really stress about, um, you know, obstacles. I just, you know that song by, um, I think it's Alicia Keys, this girl is on fire. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I just use that song and, you know, whatever fuel is to the fire, I use that to build and make myself stronger and build my brand and do what I need to do to, to serve my community. This girl's on fire, but she needs to take a break and have a rest every once in a while <laughs> so she's not getting sick. <clears throat> this is your mother speaking. Exactly. That you know, is my mom speaking. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, my mother has passed, but do you know, and this is, I don't know if it's horrible or beautiful. The number one thing I can remember my mother saying to me, I hear my mother's voice. She's saying, am I ever going to call you where you don't, I'll start off. When I say, how are you? You say, oh, I'm exhausted. Am I ever going to call you? And you're not going to say you're exhausted. Yeah. And, well, and my when, mom's favorite thing is Virginia. You can't see the world in one day. So that's always ringing in the Whoa, back of my head because I keep going and going and going. And she's like, you can't see the world in one day. You got to rest when, when you travel. Virginia, I think you, you and, and uh, you and Andy need to hook up there, man. We, <laughs> <laughs> that is just great. Um, Juanita, what's a challenge you ran into? I mean, a woman in business, 
what's a, what's a hurdle you ran into a challenge and how'd you get over it? Well, I actually, um, we, we were one of the first, um, uh, well, maybe one of the third, three family owned restaurants in Fort Wayne in 73. And, um, I think the biggest challenge for me was that I was the front of the house, uh, working with a staff in front of the house. And uh, sometimes I encountered people that uh, weren't very nice because, just because, <laughs> I don't know if it was because of my ethnic background, but you know, in the end, uh, you don't dwell on those and look, look where it's gotten me. It's, it's yeah. just, um, you, you just have to deal, know how to deal with people, with, uh, shower them with kindness, and, they, and it all comes back to you. Uh, I have really, I can't say that I've had too many challenges or barriers. Really? I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just happy about my business. <laughs> and, and my family. To do it. But don't you find that sometimes that, you know, men have difficulty listening to women and, you know, um, uh, you know, they don't, they, they're, they second guessing our thoughts or our decisions or, you know, or did you always your family and your business, you know, pe they didn't second guess you as a woman business owner? Well, no, they had a lot of confidence in me because I don't know if it's my voice or the way I walk. Uh, I, I walk very fast. Um. And, and I always felt that when you walk fast, you're going, that's for a purpose. You're getting something done. <laughs> and so uh, I have, I can't say that I've had any difficulties with uh, the uh, male counterpart uh, in business. Uh, they've been very supportive. In fact, uh, the, the whole hospitality community of family owns in Fort Wayne are so supportive of each other so you know I've lost I lost my husband 13 years ago and um, my daughter and I have, have kept the business going for 13 years after his passing so you have to really enjoy what you're doing and uh, to to stay afloat in this business got it Sarah from Star Bank what's an obstacle you've run into that you've had to get over a challenge or a difficult boss, or you had to bite your tongue till blood came out the sides of your mouth. I mean, <laughs> all of the above. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I think one of my biggest challenges early on in my um, management days uh, was I had to compete with a manager who had not been at that location in probably about 10 years. I was still being compared to him and his ways and what he could do and, and how he got things done. And um, I had to overcome that in helping customers understand the reasons why we couldn't do that anymore or without making him look bad, making the company look bad and not making me trying to show any of that. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that, that was probably my biggest challenge was competing with somebody who hadn't even been at that branch in quite some time. Yeah. And sometimes we as women, we, you know, we do use, um, in the South, we say, you know, the saying is, bless your heart, which really is not a blessing. <laughs> That's like, you are a stupid fool. And, but I'm just going to keep smiling on through it, darling. You know, yes. But um, I think women, we do sometimes have to, uh, deal with these situations and we we, we use uh, tact and kindness and bite our tongue and pleasantness and at the end of the day we win so you know um uh madeline you know tell me what's a challenge that you've had to run into as clerk treasurer money and all these kinds of things you've got to run into some things <laughs> as a woman a young woman your aunt conned you into doing this the community elected you you're pushing a baby carriage down the street you know <laughs> Um, well, um, when I was elected in 2012, well, 2011, took office in 2012, I was one of the, if not the youngest clerk treasurer in the state. Um, it was predominantly, um, I mean, clerk treasurers, it's predominantly women. However, they were all very, very much older than I was. Um, 
And uh, which is funny because now I'm one of the seasoned clerk treasurers in the state, which <laughs> makes me sound very old. But um, anyway, uh, so I had I had to deal with that. I had to deal with, um, you know, older clerk treasurers that they were all very helpful, um, but to get them to kind of um, embrace me and trust me and, and which they, they have. I'm, I'm also now serving as vice president of the clerk treasurer's league of the state. Um, oh, how interesting. So, so anyway, so I had that challenge, but then I also had the challenge of a town council that was older, um, a lot older and um, male. And uh, they, bless they his really heart. Didn't... bless his heart. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and, you know, and at that time they, they really didn't want to listen to the, the kid who doesn't know what she's talking about. And, um, and honestly, with the chamber, we've had the same exact issue. Uh, back in 2013, we were, we were on the break of dissolution. Um, you know, we were about to get absorbed by another chamber here in Whitley County. And it took a group of, you know, people who are under the age of 35, myself included, and we kind of just took it over and we got creative and we we started community events and we started new fundraising fundraisers and we went out there and really um you know put our boots on the ground and got businesses absolutely back, you know back to being interested and in, um you know being active with the chamber of commerce. Absolutely. So, so and I mean and it wasn't just you know all women it was it was really honestly our age. Um, we, yeah. we still had the successful. I mean, you guys do a heck of a job in keeping the community turtle days and keeping, but so many things, the downtown beautification, keeping it going. Yeah. Very yeah. exciting. I mean, and it takes creativity and it's, it takes, you know, that just willy, willingness and desire to actually go out and do it. You know, you can, you can talk the talk, but you really have to walk the walk too. Yeah. Right. Nyla, how about you? Have you run into any kind of challenges, diff you know, as you're going along and, you know, you know, someone not respecting you or not thinking you were capable or you yourself not visioning that you could do something and how'd you get past it? Right. Um, the one thing that I did think about, because um, it took me a while to, to, to think about this uh, topic and see, but when, um, like I said, I was in ministry for several years before I got married and I'm a support based missionary. So that means that I raise my own support. So I don't get a salary unless I have people that come alongside and give financially towards my ministry so that then I can get a paycheck. And so I had been doing that for over 10 years. And then I got married and all of a sudden my support all dropped. And I couldn't figure out what, the, what was going on, but the comments that I received was, well, now that you're married, your husband can support you and you don't need my support anymore. Oh. And so I did not anticipate that, <laughs> you know, I, um, and so it has been a challenge then to make people understand that, yes, I do have a job and I should be able to be financially compensated for the work that I do, regardless of whether or not I'm married and have a husband that can also work and provide. So that that's probably been the biggest challenge for me in ministry was that concept that now that I'm married, then I don't need to have people financially support my ministry. Very interesting. Very interesting. So we had a question um, from one of the questions from our audience. How much do the men in your life or your family help you with domestic chores? So let's start off at the top of the screen, Juanita. I mean, did your husband, you know, have dinner ready for you if it was your day to work at the restaurant? How'd that go, Juanita? Or are you bringing home takeout? What are we doing here? He was my private chef. He made the best, he was the best cook in the world. Uh, um, I cleaned up the mess. And, yeah. And, but I got to tell you, he did not know how to start the, the clothes dryer. <laughs> So uh, I took care of all of all of the uh, laundry. You did the, you did the home, the laundry, everything else. And he took care of cooking for me, and I took care of the cleaning. It was cleaning. wonderful, so wonderful, split wonderful. It. Split it. Yes, yeah, we okay. did. Um, it, uh, uh, Shanna, how, how did you know? How are you and your husband? Is your husband supportive, or the men in your life, or your older kids? Who helps with the domestic and keep life going? Yeah, so he's super supportive of 
everything that we do and the nonprofit and our family gets involved. Uh, my oldest daughter will go with me to visit moms postpartum and play with their kids while we interact. And our kids are always helping in different aspects. And uh, this was started on um, self-supported ministry money as well. And so um, there's just a lot of hats and, and it's always been a community. It's always been a family oriented uh, mission. And, but I do, my kids do pull a lot of the weight as far as they rotate cooking, they rotate dishes, they rotate, you know, chores. And so because we're all home most of the time together, um, they're trained really well. So I really couldn't do it without them and uh, come home and do everything on top of. So it's really a family effort in so many ways in, in getting things done. But um, I will say their chores aren't done the same standard, but you have to give a little like uh, flexibility that it's not done the way I would do it, but it's, it's good enough. And uh, letting that go and, and letting others, you know, help and delegate some of the responsibilities. So that's so letting others help. And, and even though and not judging on the standard, it might not be your standard. Yes, for Virginia, sure. How do you keep your house running and clean and the vacuuming do, done and everything when you're up doing, making sure that the digital ad loaded at three in the morning? Um, I usually take care of that when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have that support system that you everybody else yourself, has, yeah. but um, I just sometimes have laundry stacked up to the ceiling and I just pull from what I have and keep it moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I was a single mom for so much of my year, uh, year Sunday is afternoon, I would cook and try to cook for the whole week ahead. But I was one of those that ran the house after I did everything else from nine to midnight or one in the morning, I was cleaning, doing laundry. You know, I wasn't as good as getting the kids to do things. I, you know, I wasn't good at it. And God knows my husband wasn't any good at it. My mother said he couldn't make my mother said my father couldn't um, make a instant orange juice, you know, frozen orange juice, you know, so I kind of was raised in not I, I was never good at you know, raising the bar with the husband, not good enough at it at all. Um, uh, let's see anyone else, um, you know, the men in your life, you know, um, uh, helping you out. Um, Madeline, you know, if you've got someone that's helping you keep the house clean and you're, are you going home and doing your second eight hour job? No, uh, I'm a slob and thank goodness my husband is not. So um, my kids are also slobs. So you've got three oh, out of four people in your house oh. that do not like to do housework. But my kids also have known how to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches since they were four years old. So um, they've, they've been quite self-sufficient in their lives. Um, and it doesn't help that they won't eat anything that we cook anyway. So... <laughs> So yes, my husband is a godson. He's he's amazing, and um, he definitely does not get enough credit for all that he does to keep our house running in order. Nyla, is your husband helping out, or is he saying, "Well, I work all day"? No, I have a great husband. I couldn't ask for anything more. And yes, they're during tax season from January second until April fifteenth. He is not home, and so. Yes, I take the full load uh, during that time. But even then, I'll give him credit. His, he's got a streak going right now this year so far from January 1st. He has unloaded the dishwasher every single time and has not missed a time yet this year. So even during tax season. So so I, I give him great credit. That is his job and he takes very much, very good pride in, in doing a good job with that. Is this T connecting here? T, is that you? Yeah, take off your mute, huh? You're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, there we go. There Can you go. Hey, T. Yeah, let me introduce you quickly. So T Cook had a health uh, health issue that slowed her down. She couldn't get on the call. Um, but now let's just catch up. T Cook is with all in one of um, all in one events. We got a couple minutes left left here. T, thank you for joining us. So let's start off with T. Tell our audience about you and your business. Oh my goodness. Um, I am a full service event company. We do everything from corporate events to baby showers. And I do everything from the cake to the decorations to invitations to all of them. I do it all. Um, I also am in a process of opening a health and wellness center. Um, I also have another business, Praying Hands Health Education and Wellness Center in which I teach a bunch of classes. I teach CPR. Um, I do a bunch of support groups for like depression and grief. And I'm just kind of all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, everybody read about T in the um, in the special section, which is now live on fwbusiness.com, the influential nice. women special section. So you can read all about T. T also just real quick, what's a challenge you've run into in your life, you know, and that you had to overcome, you know, whether it was a bad boss back there discouraged you or did you hold yourself back and think I'm not capable of doing this. I'm over my head. Talk to us about a challenge you ran into and that you had to overcome before we wrap up here. I'm so sorry to be joining late, um, but my biggest thing for me was um, being a black entrepreneur, being black and my, I've been very, I've done a lot of stuff. Like I know I'm, we're running late, but the biggest challenge for me is because I'm so passionate about what I do and being, I'm just a force. I'm not going to lie. People say I'm aggressive. I've been, I've been tagged as the angry black woman. And I'm not angry at all. I'm really like, really, I'm sorry. I can't pay attention. I'm driving, but I'm not an angry woman. Like just because I'm driven and I've had to fight really hard to get to where I am. I just got my doctorate this year. Like I've had to fight really, really hard to get where I am. And because of that, I've had to deal with that, that label. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, that label, but I think that, um, I think we all get sort of labeled with, um, you know, that um, when I was young, younger, Stay Street Bank sent me to this management course, and I'm, let's wrap up with this. They sent me to this course at American Management Association in Manhattan, and it was because um, Stay Street Bank was, uh, the EEOC was on them, because I was, it was in the 70s, and I'm old, and uh, they didn't have enough women in management. So they're like, well, let's send her and see if we can get her into management at the bank. And, um, you know, they talked to us about the fact that um, if, if you're in a table of people, men and women together, whether it's a chamber board meeting, a, a, you know, anything, you know, if we're really upset about something, it's like, ugh, that, you know, you know what, B-I-T, ugh, she's yep. just emotional. But yep. if a man's upset to said about something, it's, well, John's really concerned about this issue, you know, whereas if we act that way, you know, it's like, oh, must be the wrong time of the month, right? And, you know, and then the other thing that they talked about was how to get equal footing in a setting with men. When women, when we come into a meeting and you're going to watch and catch yourself doing this, we sit down and we're ready for the meeting, Got our papers here. We have our pen. We're all nice and neat, ready to go. Men come into a meeting and go, so John, how you been? You know, how's the golf game? They take up space as if I matter, whatever. And so I learned that. And um, it's, you know, that and being tough. Um, I've been labeled tough my whole life, T, in the newspaper business, which is a very male-dominated field. And yes, I probably am tough, but... You just fight on, honey. That's fight right. on. That's I'm right. so glad you could join us. Everybody read about tea and everything. All of you are inspirational. It's great. This is the second hour, the first hour too. If you missed the first hour to our audience, please watch the video. Share it on your Facebook page. Yes. This is how we share experiences. And you don't know which one of the things you said is going to ring with somebody, you know, and, and make a difference in their day, you know, and we all go through things. Um, so thank you so much for doing this, working with our reporters for the special section and nominate women next year for this. We'll do it every year, every October, hopefully next year for a luncheon, come to the luncheon, meet some other cool women. Thank you guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.